do you want to start us off by telling us a little bit about what you mean by this idea of learning to lead with your soul? Absolutely. Um, as a psychotherapist and a coach and someone who has uh, worked with so many thousands of people and as someone who has been a seeker myself and who has been what I have called chronically single for many decades before finding the love of my life and um, building a family with him, the thing that I have learned which is actually a very positive thing. It's, it's good news, but it's a bit disconcerting because it's so different than what we're often taught, is that there really is one great key to success in love, in finding love and in keeping love. And that key is in you already. It's your soul and what I mean by your soul is I mean the person you really are, your deepest authenticity. And that includes the things that inspire you in a relationship, the things that touch your heart, the things that hurt you, the things that make you feel numb or unhappy or disconnected or joyful and engaged and sexual and romantic it's the nuances of your truest self. And there is only one key to finding real love and making it last. And that is honoring and cherishing those parts of you and doing the same for your partner. Unfortunately, so much dating advice tells us, in essence, how we have to fix ourselves or improve ourselves to find love. There is a fixing and there is an improving, but that fixing and improving that needs to be done is fixing and improving the degree to which we come from our heart and our soul and our truth in our search for love. That's the only real fixing. So when we start thinking, it's really about those five pounds or those 25 pounds, or it's really about my glutes or my abs, or it's really about my age, or it's really about like, I don't act confident enough. We are screwed, unequivocally, unquestionably screwed. We're going to, a few things are going to happen. There's going to be a cascade of consequences that come out of putting those things first. There's going to be a sense of emptiness inside. It's going to be a sense of desperation. Worse even is there going to be, there's going to be a sense of non-self-love or even self-loathing. We think we're trying to improve ourselves, but we're criticizing ourselves. And that always leads to bad places. Also, what that kind of approach leads to, which really stinks, but it's really true, it leads us to be sexually and romantically attracted to people who don't love us for who we are. It's an amazing thing how that happens. But so what I would say to all of you is look great. It's a joy and a gift to yourself. I am not saying you shouldn't do that. But what I am saying is don't put that stuff first. Put first that you lead with your soul. You lead with your most authentic self. You lead with your heart. You show your most beautiful, vulnerable, passionate self and then you only choose people that treat those parts of you with dignity, respect, and cherishing. You do that and you will shave years off of your search for love. And more importantly, you will magnetize the person who's right for you because you'll be finding someone who loves you for who you are because you're going to be showing who you are as opposed to someone who... Um, sees the person you're presenting. And let me tell you this, let me say one other thing. When we try to lead with a self that we've been told, oh, this will be more attractive. This will magnetize the right quality, man. When we start leading with those things, I'll tell you who we draw. We draw people who feed on our insecurity. That's who we draw because it's an insecurity-based place. Finally, the last thing I'm going to say about this at just this introductory point is this, is that when you lead with your heart, when you lead with your soul, that's the time that your magic starts transmitting and beaming.
You can't forge that magic. You can't fake that magic. It's in you. It's your soul. It's the person you are. And when you decide, when you make this conscious decision, I'm going to lead with that part, even if it feels awkward, and I'm only going to choose the people that treasure it, you are going to start beaming it out. And I pretty much can promise you that the kind of people you will meet will change for the better. And you will find yourself meeting and being drawn to and more attracted to people who are really good for you and who could give you the possibility of a sustainable, wonderful, lasting love. So the bottom line is this. When you lead with your soul, magic happens. Healing happens. Love happens. Generosity of spirit happens. When you lead with the fabricated self that you think is going to find you love you're screwed from the beginning and it's going to hurt wow ken i can't even tell you how much that resonates with me and how mm. i feel i sense that deeply and i sensed it as truth i sensed it as truth and it is oh, so different from what we're the, what the messages are from so many different sources out there. I yes. mean, we're killing ourselves literally in some cases to try to look a certain way or to try to look good, to avoid looking bad and to, to mask that authenticity and that vulnerability. And it's, it's not having the intended effect. I mean, I know I, I was chronically single too, Ken, <laughs> for mm -hmm. a long time. Yes, we share that. <laughs> Yeah, so I didn't meet and marry my husband until I was 43. And I know for many years as a single woman, I don't even know how much money I spent, Ken, on right. certain clothes, <laughs> shoes, makeup, you know, because I thought I had to look a certain way. Yeah. And I thought everything had to look perfect on the outside. And so I, I went to huge expense and huge trouble to try to mask really who I was. Yes, yes, yes. Right, right. It's so counterproductive. And, you know, what I want to say to every person who is listening, all the women and the men who might be listening to, um, people of all orientations, all gender identities, all backgrounds, everyone who's welcome to this wonderful community of learning, what I want to say to all of you is do not worry about being irresistible to quality men or women. In fact, don't even think about that. That is guaranteed to cause you anguish. Worry about what your heart and your soul is telling you about what matters. Because the degree, this is the deeper physics of love, the degree to which you suppress or hide your truest self is the degree to which you're going to be sexually and romantically attracted to people who are bad for you. The degree to which you make like a really brave determination that you're going to lead with your own beautiful soul, that that's going to be the essence of your new dating plan. You will find yourself drawing people who love you for who you are, and you'll find yourself more attracted to them. It's an amazing thing, but it's true. And it saddens me so deeply that we're taught that this dating journey is an outside-in journey, a numbers game, a fix-the-outside journey. That's the path to hell. It's inside out. And what's inside you, the beauty of your heart, I promise you, is what's going to find you the person you're dreaming of. In fact, even taking that a step further, I'm going to ask everyone a question now for you to think about. And it's going to help you know kind of where this key pivotal point is. So what I want to ask you is to take a minute to think what are the parts of yourself that you feel timid, most timid and vulnerable to show in your dating life? Now, I don't mean um, things that have happened in your history or in your story that might be embarrassing or difficult. That's not what I'm referring to here. I'm talking about parts of your personality that maybe you've decided, oh, that part of me is too tender. It's too sensitive or it's too passionate. It's too intense. It's too alive. Well, what I want to tell you is the parts of you that you are most timid to reveal in your dating life are actually the greatest key to you finding love.
And when you flip this around and say, I'm not going to be ashamed of those parts. I'm going to lead with those parts and I'm only going to choose those amazing people who treasure them. When you make that brave, brave choice, everything changes. It's a miracle. It's a miracle of, of human evolution and human wisdom that the parts of ourselves that we most feel embarrassed about, ashamed about, or insecure about, the places we're most tender of showing are where our soul lives and where our greatest beauty lies. And those are the parts that we have to actually learn to lead with. That's an amazingly inspiring concept, but it also explains why the journey your journey to find love is perhaps one of, if not the greatest spiritual adventures of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Ken, as I'm listening to this, I'm, I'm thinking of potential questions that our audience might have. Sure. It might be, especially for those of us that have been doing the, you know, the dance of seduction for so long or trying to be irresistible. Cause I know I did that for a long time. Me too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure, because now you can write about it, right? <laughs> you, you, you've been there, done that, bought that T-shirt. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, and in fact, uh, at a later point, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about my story. Uh, okay, that would be great. Yeah. So, but for those of us that have been caught up in that trap for a long time, because I know I was, um, how do we, first of all, even tap into knowing what those parts of our soul are um, yes, they might be tender spots or whatever. And then how do we lead with, how do we lead with that? Like, I'm just trying to kind of anticipate what might be going on in, in the minds of some of the listeners. Like when I was caught in that trap and, and moving toward, you know, a greater understanding of myself and what was holding me back, I'm not sure I would have known even what those things were or how I would lead with that. So yes. for those of us that are kind of still in the remedial class, <laughs> so to speak, we haven't, we haven't made that, um, we, we haven't had that awareness yet. How do we start? Oh, that's such, such a wonderful question. Um, and, and I want to say something first before I answer it. This is a very, I mean, I imagine that a lot of the people listening are, are thinking this idea is really interesting may be touching, may be hopeful, may be inspiring, but also kind of like, what? That's counterintuitive, and it's the opposite of what I've been taught. How do I start? How do I make sense of this? What does it even mean that the parts of me I've been the most insecure about are the key to my finding real love? Right. So I want to acknowledge that. Yes, this is a, this is a wisdom journey, and it's a big deal journey. And I, I want to say two things. One is, I want to give you some initial steps that will help you begin to think of this in a new way. But I also want to say, and I think these steps will make sense to you as you hear them, but I also want to say that it is a deeper journey and it's a more intense journey and that, that for anyone who is interested in taking this further, um, my book is kind of a deeper course in a book that, 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 that kind of takes you through the steps. My courses do that as well. It's not a quick and easy journey. It's a profound journey. So um, what I'm going to give you is going to be, I think, a, a lovely beginning. But if this appeals to you, there's, you know, there's, there's a, you know, richer levels of this journey still to come. Um, so, here is how you can begin to discover what on some level you know already, but kind of has to be re-honored and re-taught. How do you find your soul? And, and, and this concept of like leading with your soul um, is something that came from my, my good friend, Chip Conley, who is a, an entrepreneur, visionary, human potential expert, and just one of the most brilliant business people and also humanists um, around today. And he read my book and he came out with this tiny sentence, which is, if you want to find your soulmate, learn to lead with your soul. And I just said, oh my God, you captured my whole book in that one phrase. So, um, so how do you find your soul? How do you find these attributes? Well, 
there are just a few questions that you can ask yourself that will help you discover these parts of yourself. And here are the two questions. And I'm going to kind of lead you through this a little bit. Every day, there are things that inspire you and touch you and move you. And there are things that hurt you and feel wrong to you. There are things that feel really right. And there are things that don't feel right. There are things that make you feel more connected to your heart and soul and things that make you feel more disconnected from your heart and soul. And what we don't do is notice that enough and honor it enough. And God knows in our dating life, we don't do that. And it's the absolute essential key. So if you start noticing on a more conscious level, and you even, I even have an exercise that I teach where you take two days and a journal and try this exercise. As you go through your day from your first morning, morning cup of coffee to when you go to sleep, for a period of two days, and let them be days that are not super, super busy with work, no 12-hour work days on these, on these days, notice what things give you a sense of peace. That's an indication that you are touching your soul. What things give you a sense of love? What things give you a sense of deep longing? What things give you a sense of rightness, of comfort, of goodness? Notice those things and write them down. And after two days, look for the common themes. And it's going to be like a connect the dots picture. You connect the dots and a picture emerges. You will start to understand these parts of your soul. How do we know where to find our soul? In the things that touch our hearts the most and inspire us the most, and in the things that hurt us the most. Because it's in those places we are most connected to our soul. It's in the things that we care about the most, the places where life touches us the most deeply, that our soul lies but we're not taught how to name them. And until we're taught how to name those attributes, which I call core gifts, we're gonna walk around and kind of lost. So notice the things that inspire you and learn to dignify them. Learn to say to yourself, okay, this is what matters to me the most. And I bet in your relationships, those very same things matter the most. Maybe it's a quality of honesty. Maybe it's a quality of goodness. Maybe it's a quality of loyalty. What I want to tell you is the degree to which you dignify those qualities and honor them, to that degree, you're going to become attracted to people that, that honor those qualities in you too. To the degree that you don't treasure them, you will meet people that step on you in those very places, even if it's not obvious at first. <sighs> Notice as well in those, yeah, 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 it's, it's a formula. It's the deeper physics of love. The other piece is notice the things that hurt you, that hurt your heart, that make you feel disconnected or sad or just not right inside. And instead of telling yourself, oh, I'm too sensitive, start telling yourself, you know what? I'm probably right. This bothers me because there's something off about it that my soul notices. And the minute you stop discounting those things and start honoring them, your relationship life and all dimensions will change because you will gain a dignity where you will champion your deepest values, maybe for the first time. And that's how we date in a wiser way. Mm -hmm. So those are ways to kind of like begin to sense your soul. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that, Ken, because that's really helpful, something that the women can actually begin to work with and experiment with on this journey. And like Ken said, there are ways to go deeper with Ken's work, but I'm so grateful for you giving us a starting point. And, you know, one of the things that... Uh, Michelle, I'm so sorry. Could I just say, add one more piece to that? Sure. Great, great, great. Thank you. Um, I want to make it a little, like, like my first concept was very theoretical. This second one was maybe a little more um, integrated or grounded, but I want to like take it to the next step, like nitty gritty dating life. Like, what does this mean? And I'll tell you just what it means. You're on a date with somebody and 
you start noticing the very things I described. You notice like not, you know, because so you're on a date with somebody and you're going to be thinking a million times, do I like this person? Does this person like me? Mm -hmm. Am I attracted? Is this other person attracted? Uh, do this person's credentials measure up? Am I interested enough? Are they interested enough in me? All right, well, we're going to have those questions streaming through our heads. That's just human. But I want you to drop down into your, into your guts, into your feeling. And in the course of the date, just notice, not what am I thinking, not how am I evaluating myself and that other person, but what does the weather feel like inside in the presence of this person? And you'll notice something different. You'll notice your soul responding to this person. And you may feel something like, wow, he or she may not be my exact type, but I feel so safe with this person. Or this person really makes me laugh. Or there's a warmth and a goodness that I can sense here. Or you'll feel, ooh, why do I feel cold? Why do I feel distant? Why do I feel judged? Why do I feel self-conscious? Those are all signs of your souls interacting and what happens as a result of that. So on your next date, notice, is my soul feeling safe? Is my soul, is my heart feeling comfortable? Do I feel inspired by this person's goodness, stability, decency? And if not, he's probably not the guy for you. But of course, you want to give it time and space because everybody's nervous on a date. But that's an example of how you can start dropping down into your deeper self and noticing who feels right and who feel, who doesn't feel right. And I'll tell you, within the first date, maybe the second date, you will start knowing as you drop down into that part, do you feel good? Do you feel safe? Do you feel right with that person? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, I think that's so important. It helps us also to get out of just the head, the head space where we just have yeah. the, the thoughts going a mile a minute in, in our minds when we're on a date. And yeah. yes, there's nerves, like you said, but if you, if we can drop down into that feeling side of things into our hearts and into our souls, that's going to be a guide that we may not be fully tapping into. Do you remember, Michelle, when you went on, on your first dates with your husband, if you, you can remember what you felt inside that might have been different on that level? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, it's a good question. And I'm thinking back, we've been married now for 11 years. And uh, I do remember that I, I do remember that I did feel good with him. I felt safe in his presence. And I did feel I felt comfortable with him. I just felt relaxed. I didn't feel like I had to put on the perfect, perfect facade. I felt like I could just be real. Now, I had done a lot of work prior to that to help myself realize that being authentic and being vulnerable was actually something that opened the door to intimacy because someone could actually really see you. And I, and I think that opens the door for someone else to f be vulnerable and to feel safe showing their real selves too. Yep. Yep. And so, so that was a big, that was a big part of it. And, and there was no, how do I say this? There was no game playing. There was no cat and mouse us trying to, you know, outmaneuver each other or figure out, you know, what to say here or what to say there or fearing that if we did something awkward or silly, um, that the other person would leave. In fact, my husband told me a funny quote, and I think this is not something he made up, but I don't know what the source of it is. But it said, in order to really, truly feel safe with a, a lover, you have to know that if you're running across the field, uh, toward them and you happen to trip on the way that they're going to come rescue you rather than laugh or leave you. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you that's know, you, what we have. Uh, that's right. And you noticed it right away. And I just want to highlight that. I want to put that like on a, um, on a beautiful kind of like little, uh, I don't know what, like a, a beautiful place where that can rest. And I want to say this to everyone who's listening. That's what you want to look for. Of course, you want to be physically attracted to someone. You don't have to be with someone just because they're a good person if you're not, you know, attracted at least over time to them. 
But what you want is a feeling, an innate feeling. This person is good. This person is decent. This person is caring, kind, and safe. And let me tell you, if you don't feel that, he's not for you or she's not for you. If you're not feeling that, at least a couple dates in, don't waste your time. If you are feeling it, celebrate and realize that that's what you're looking for. And unfortunately, we have two circuitries of attraction. We have an inadequacy circuitry and we have a soul circuitry. Yeah. Our inadequacy circuitry is going to get so triggered and turned on by people who are almost available, almost love us, almost respect us, almost treat us right. Sexiest thing in the world. In fact, those people who make you so turned on that you and, and excited that you feel like insecure, you feel sick, you feel off balance, usually are turning you on to that wild degree because unconsciously you know that they represent and hold some of the worst characteristics of your primary caregivers. And some deep part of your psyche is going back to get the person in the ways that you weren't loved to finally love you right. Not the best recipe. But when you meet someone who you feel soul attracted to, that your soul feels safe and good with, often you think, well, this isn't exciting enough or I want to get out of here, or I want that old, wild itch of the hunt. You need to give it time and space. Because with the right person, those deep, rich qualities of safety and goodness are going to blossom into sex, into love, into intimacy, into a deeper, wonderful bond in the right case. And you want to give it the time and space for that. It's like fool's gold versus real gold. And fool's gold looks really good at first, but it's not what you want. Yeah, and you know, it's so interesting what you're talking about here in terms of chemistry and attraction, because one of the other things I remember about my husband, although I'm very attracted to him, he wasn't the person that when I first saw him, I wanted to just, you know, fall over uh, and went yep. completely weak in the knees. That's I right. Attractive, but it wasn't like, oh, wow, knock me out kind of attraction, that kind of attraction right. that we often equate as being love. Exactly, exactly. But yes. as I got to know him and got to know his character and who he was, the kind of person that he was, the kindness that he showed me, the safety that I felt with him, I became to, I, I admire him so much and I, I felt this attraction growing and growing and growing and it was a deeper level of attraction than just that initial physical attraction that you might see when you see a really attractive person. Whereas yeah. some of the people I had dated in the past, I had that, you know, that irresistible, felt irresistible kind of immediate physical attraction, but we were a disaster together. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. And it's a different circuitry of attraction. And it feels like love, that negative circuitry. Mm -hmm. But it's a scratch the itch kind of love that never gets satisfied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. And you and yet it can be so seductive that it's it can be tempting to keep investing in those kind of relationships. I yeah. mean, I know you have worked with people and I've worked with people and I've been there myself where, you know, we, we believe or they believe that if we keep investing in this relationship, it's going to eventually turn into more and we can get caught up in that fantasy because of that attraction, that physical attraction or whatever. But it's true what you're saying. It's, it's such a painful journey because it is that itch that never can be scratched. Yes. It goes away, and it's never going to be that soul satisfying, deep kind of love that I think most of us are longing for. Yeah, and if you find yourself in a position where you think like, um, "My life will have meaning," or "I will prove my worth," or "I'll be justified," or "I'll be lovable," or "I'll be sexy," if this person finally really loves me. That's like a child holding a beautiful, colored, broken shard of glass in their hand. 
and they don't want to let go of it, even though it's cutting into them. And if someone tries to remove it from their hand, they scream, they cry. I would say in my work as a therapist and as a coach and in my own life, that's the hardest thing when you've got this kind of thing that you have told yourself it's love, but it just keeps hurting you to actually say, I am going to let go of this. It's a big, big act. And then when you make this decision, and I encourage each one of you to make this decision, even right now, I am only going to choose people who inspire me with their goodness, their decency, their consistency, their generosity, and their essential solidness. Only anyone else, I'm done with. When you make that choice, your world changes. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and happiness comes to you. And I know that for me, decades of looking for love and failing, you know, for so many years, I never had a relationship that lasted over six weeks. Oh, and then I, I went into six people. weeks. Oh, God. My and, um, heart just hurts because I've, I've been through so many of those experiences. Oh, God, six weeks. Yes, yes, yes. And then I began to discover, little by little, by going into therapy, that I could actually be myself, not this other, more attractive person. And as I did that, I started meeting people who were attracted to my goodness more because I started looking for goodness. And the more I chose goodness, the more I showed my goodness, the more the kind of guys that I've met changed until I finally met my husband and um, who is a very, very good person, a wonderful, decent person. And we were able to build and create a very beautiful life together. But I would have run for the hills if I met him years before. I would have dumped him like a hot potato because something in me would have said, I need something more exciting. But that more exciting thing was trying to get someone who didn't love me to love me. And I didn't know the richness and the depth and the intoxicating excitement that could come with a truly wonderful person who loves me for who I am, that the greatest happiness comes in that way. And that's my hope for each one of you, is that you make that kind of existential shift where you say, that's all I'm going for. I am going to wait until I find a person who treasures my soul and who feels stable and steady essentially in that. And when you make that commitment, you are going to be so much more likely to find that person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for, thank you so much for sharing that, Ken. I mean, this is just so, what you're teaching here, I just think is so important and so valuable and so deep it is a journey i mean hence your book is called deeper dating right this is not just the uh you know what shall i say in a text or what are the right things to say right. on the first date kind of tips this is this is deep soul work like you said this could be the biggest oh. spiritual journey of one's life and yeah. what more important what more important journey could we be on that's right that's right then the journey to find and build love and this is the other thing when you find someone like that Your life in some ways is just beginning because you're going to build a world together and it's going to be a world based on those qualities and it's going to change the world. It's going to affect the world and it's going to create a home in the world for you. So that the ripple effects of choosing wisely and choosing from a place of soul go on and on and on because the two of you are going to be creating a world together and that's what you want. Yeah, and I like what you said at the beginning too, Ken, when you said if you're approaching things this way, if you can really get this, uh, con- these concepts that Ken is teaching, it can literally shave years off your journey of being out there wandering in the dating wilderness, so to speak. Yes. Right? Yes, exactly. I mean, exactly. I feel like I wandered out there in the dating oh. wilderness for so many years, and it was so agonizing and so painful. Yes. Oh, yes. the pain. Yes, yes. I mean, and and I believe because one of our deepest human desires is to love, be loved, to know and be known on that soul level. Mm. That's why we're willing to go through all of these things. But when we don't have a roadmap, wow, can it be like wandering in the dating wilderness? Oh, you couldn't have said that any better. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I mean, I, 
I, it, it, I've been married to my wonderful husband now for 11 years, but I haven't forgotten. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. haven't forgotten all of those years and what that felt like and how I just thought, I, I didn't know. I didn't know where, I didn't know what I was doing wrong. I, I couldn't understand it. I was, I thought I was following all of the right advice. Right? Yes. Yes, exactly. You know, um, the, 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 uh, the mystic whose name is um, Meister Eckhart, a Christian mystic from, I think the 1500s, he said, there is a way to make a, and I'm paraphrasing, there's a way to make a perfect circle. And that way is you start from the center. And we are taught to date from the outside in, and that's the path to hell. It's everything you just described. But when we start, when you start with your soul and the dignity, the goodness and the truth and the authenticity of your soul, the entire journey changes. The other thing that happens is that you become more, you know, this thing about making yourself more attractive that so many people get lost in. The funny truth is that when you decide to come with from your true self, you become more attractive. You develop a gravity. You know, interestingly, um, you develop because you're yourself and the more self you are, it's like the more mass you have, not physical mass, but spiritual mass. The more you're yourself, the more presence you have. And just like in physics, the more mass that an object has, the more gravity it has. And gravity is defined as a source that pulls other things toward its center. And that is what happens for you when you lead with your soul. You attract people who are meant for you. You pull them to your center, and you'll see that that change really happens. But that magnetism is not a game. It's your soul. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. And this way, we're not approaching love in that kind of pursuing numbers game kind of thing that kind of way that is so often taught that you've referred to earlier on as well. We're yeah. more or less just being or showing up as our real true authentic selves, leading with the soul. And so it probably doesn't feel as much like a, oh my goodness, I've got to reach out to this many people online or I've got to do this and that. And it becomes like a, a chore. Right, exactly, exactly. It's really true. But I do want to acknowledge that it's a very brave thing. It's a brave thing. And you know what? You probably aren't able to do it alone. You need a friend or a few friends. You know, in my book, I tell everybody, get a learning partner and do these steps with the learning partner. I teach that in my course. And I say to each one of you, have people people who get this, that you could talk with regularly. Because, you know, I remember I actually started a group for chronically single psychotherapists. And I met with this group and we helped each other because there's a million crossroads that we tend to kind of like not know what to do with. And if you've got some wise friends that want to tackle this same journey of authenticity, use them, work with them, let them encourage you, push you, support you. That's why I lead support groups and create support groups for people who want to take this deeper journey because it's just about almost impossible to completely do on your own for most of us. We need help because it's so, it takes a lot of bravery. Yeah. Yeah. It is a courageous journey for sure. It is. It is. Yes. Well, Ken, I just, I so, go ahead. Oh, well, that's just why I'm so glad that you're doing the work that you're doing, Michelle, because I feel like you are a beacon of that message. And um, I so appreciate that. Oh, well, thank you. That's a really deep compliment coming from you because you know how much I admire you and your work and how much I just love connecting with you. And I really, really am grateful to be able to feature you again because I believe that what you're teaching has the capacity to really make a difference in people's lives. And for those of us that are taking a stand for love, so to speak, in the world, um, it means a lot to me to be able to share not only my own messages, but the messages of people like yourself, Ken, who I admire so much. So, Vice President Michelle, thank you.
So Ken and I both honor you for being here today. Yes, We're yes. grateful for your presence. And Ken, again, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your kindness and support and love and for uh, uh, being willing to support me in my mission of spreading love in the world, too. And uh, mm, it's been an honor good. to have you with me. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's great to be here. Okay, everybody, take care and bye-bye for now.